This is the point where we descend into the Danakil Depression itself, to the hottest place on Earth. In the 60s, an American mining company set up a huge industrial operation here to mine potash for fertilizer. The venture lasted two years before the unrelenting desert heat forced them to close. But during that time, they recorded an annual temperature record that still stands, an average of 34.4 degrees centigrade day and night. Unbelievably, where the machines failed, humans succeed. Part of Mukul's mission is to look at how the locals cope with working in such extreme temperatures. So he's devised a little experiment. He's volunteered two guinea pigs, Steve and me, to try our hands at mining while he monitors our body heat from the inside. I'm going to swallow some uh, little radio transmitters that are temperature sensors to see what the temperature is inside us. The capsule is this thing, which is a little radio mic. Little? <laughs> That's a horse. <laughs> <laughs> That's a jelly bean. <laughs> so you, it's a radio transmitter? It's a radio transmitter, and it will tell me what the temperature inside you is. Do you want this back? Kate, <laughs> Kate you need to bring your own back. <laughs> When we get to the mine, Mukul hopes to persuade some local miners to swallow identical transmitters so he can find out if their bodies have some inbuilt adaptation to the heat or if they've just learned to put up with it. Steady on there, Mukul. We've walked just short of eight kilometres this morning. The temperature now is 41 degrees and it's 10 past 11 in the morning. But the good news is on the horizon, there are all sorts of extraordinary shapes which can only be camels. So I think we're in striking distance of the mines. We are speechless as we arrive. It's as though we have walked through a window in time. This incredible scene has barely changed since the time of Julius Caesar. Every day, hundreds of men and boys hack blocks of salt from the ground by hand, after they've walked the same exhausting route we've just taken in the baking heat. You can see the scale of it because obviously this is where they're working, but look how far. That's probably hundreds, if not thousands, of years they've been doing. Oh my god, that is incredible. I'm, I'm kind of overwhelmed, to be honest. It's like going back about 2,000 years. And it also makes you think you will never, ever, ever take for granted that little pot of salt on your table ever again. My goodness. There are two jobs here, splitting and lifting the great salt slabs, then shaping them into precise one kilogram blocks. This turns one of Ethiopia's few natural resources into hard currency. One block of, of this salt is how much for the caravan people? Each block is worth five pence down here, but they're worth ten times as much in the markets in the highlands. And the miner gets just two pounds for a 12-hour shift of back-breaking work in the hottest place on earth. Yeah. Just, I thought mining scary. down the bottom of a hole would be hard, but this looks incredibly hard. So, mm. OK, come on. <laughs> Which takes us to Mukul's experiment. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready, yeah, yeah. With our temperature transmitters working inside us, Steve and I try our hand at mining the Afar way. OK, so one, two, three, bounce. Okay. Two, three, bounce. <laughs> one, two, three, bounce. Hang on, 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 Steve. Wait, 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 wait. I okay. need to get more purchase here. OK, one, two, three. <laughs> One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Hey! 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 Hey!
and I can feel my heart rate's gone up. <laughs> Something wrong. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mukul is persuading the locals to swallow one of his capsules. One of the miners has very kindly agreed to uh, swallow one of the core capsules for us, and it'd be very interesting to see whether a miner reaches the same temperatures that uh, Kate and Steve will reach while they're working in these mines. I'm not sure what our core temperatures are, but after a few minutes, Steve and I are really struggling in the heat. <laughs> I'm sweating! Oh. While Gary, who swallowed the other capsule, seems totally unaffected. You have to do more. You have to do faster. Be good. Like <laughs> so what's Mukul's metre reading? You look hot. You look, actually, you have gone red. I did, certainly. I felt like I had. What the readings show is Gary, who's been working here all day, hasn't really got very much above 37 degrees. And, and you guys, yeah. who've only really done 15 minutes' worth, <laughs> have risen a whole degree to 38 degrees. Wow. One degree doesn't sound much, but just two degrees higher would put both of us at serious risk of heat stroke. It doesn't stop. That's the most amazing thing. You know, I can do it for short bursts, but nothing like this. It just goes on and on. What's clear is that in this heat, Gary's body actually functions differently from ours. So Gary basically is has adapted or is genetically well, able to deal with that, this? What do you think? That's the question we haven't yet answered in this trip. Well, we've undoubtedly answered from the Afar and uh, Gary, who's a Highland, Highland Ethiopian, is that they manage heat completely differently. They're much more efficient. At the moment, we can't say why the Afar are better suited to the heat than us. But Mukul hopes to repeat the experiment in a few weeks' time to see if, after living here a while, our bodies show any signs that they've adapted. But however well adapted we humans get, we'll never match these guys. The Afar's camels are already the perfect desert machine. Evolution is a very, very powerful thing. There isn't a scrap of uh, design in this camel that isn't actually des um, enabling it to, to cope with this environment. They don't waste anything. They can hang onto their water. They can push out very, very concentrated urine. Mine gets sort of fairly dark and this sort of thing, but I have to produce a certain level of urine. They produce a really, really concentrated urine, therefore saving that water uh, to keep them going, to keep their blood pumping around their veins. Oh. I've got some uh, fresh camel urine here for you. As you can see, it is very, very dark. It's very, very um, yellow, which, which tends to mean it's, it's concentrated. OK, the other way of telling that is, is that if you dip your finger in it and then, and then lick it, it's very, very salty. Kate, do you want to come and try this? What, lick your camel urine? Yeah, yes, yeah. I'd love to. I can't think of anything I'd like okay. to do more. So basically, just, just dip a finger in and just put it on the tip of your tongue. And You're you serious, take... No, yeah, you? serious, yeah. So just dip. Whose is it? Yep. It's this guy's over here. He's fine. Oh, I just want to know who yeah. it is. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. I'm not just tasting any yeah, old yeah. urine. Now, what you... Does it taste salty? Taste of urine. Yeah. Well, what you didn't realise... Nice. What you